share with you quickly. All right. OK, can I ask the, the speakers if you're not speaking, please just put yourself on mute for us. All right, so today we're discussing the impossible puzzle of cybersecurity. I think uh, cybersecurity has been a huge factor the last couple of months. There was a lot of people affected by it, and we thought it would be a good idea to chat to our customers and some of our internal teams around this and just uh, show some stats, get the pros involved, let them come and chat to us about it and tell us a little bit more. So just a little bit of an agenda. I'll run quickly through the house rules with you guys. Then after that, we'll ask Lucas Pelser, the pre-sales engineer from Sophos, to talk, talk to us about the impossible puzzle of cybersecurity. Sean Hancock, our ISP manager for Sador Networks, will then do a short introduction into Sador Networks and how we use Sophos as part of our solution. And then there will be a closing from my side and just there will be some some uh, Q&A session at the end. So house rules, this meeting will be recorded. So if you feel uncomfortable um, to be recorded, please, please leave the meeting. Um, this is for purposes for sharing afterwards to people that were unable to make this this uh, webinar this morning. There will be a chat box that's open for questions. So please post your questions there throughout the presentations and the questions will be answered at the end. If you've got any technical support throughout the webinar, please contact Nikhil. There's his email ad address and his phone number if you want to make a quick snapshot. All right. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Lucas. Excellent. Okay. Um, I can just ask you if you can see my screen. Let me know. Yes, we can. All right, good. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for your time this morning. Um, just ways of introductions. Uh, um, so Elaine's already done it, but um, Lucas, um, I work as a pre-sales engineer for Sophos. Um, I've been around for about three years at Sophos. Previously, I was security architect at the South African Reserve Bank. <clears throat> and um, before that, I actually worked for Cisco Systems. I love, breathe, eat cyber security. Um, the inter internet is a little bit of my playground. Um, I've got a, a, quite a funky history in cyber security, but um, since 13, I've been uh, in the game of uh, doing impersonation attacks and uh, social engineering attacks and so on. So um, what I thought would be relevant, relevant for today's topic is the, the impossible puzzle of cyber security. And it really is um, just around what is happening in the industry today. Uh, working for a vendor is a very interesting uh, place to be at at the moment. If you Google stop ransomware, um, Sophos is an international company, so we do pop up in the first Google searches. So you can imagine the kind of calls we get on a daily basis. Um, we get about five ransomware cases on a weekly basis. And we get involved in trying to help those customers recover from it or understand how they were breached. So what I found interesting is Sophos actually did a survey worldwide around, uh, we spoke to IT decision makers, whether it's an administrator or an IT manager, and we asked them um, if they can honestly tell us if they have been breached or have had an attack. We didn't ask for any details or too much detail, but we asked them, is it relevant to their organization? And what I found interesting working for 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 a a, a US based uh, a company, the surveys normally just go uh, around the world, and we see surveys around um, in terms of uh, different countries and so on. And Africa seems to be um, just floating around, and we never really get information around what is happening in Africa. And what we did is we actually found two hundred um, IT decision makers in South Africa. And the the results were quite shocking. So we actually, um, just from a demographics point of view, um, most of the, the organizations that um, do fall victim to cyber crimes is IT and telecommunication companies and then financial services. But what, what, what I found interesting is that the manufacturing and production industry 
is fourth on the list. And um, it really was quite an interesting uh, survey I've seen. And um, we've also actually, I've just helped a customer actually last week where they are a manufacturing Have we lost Lucas? Yes, Lou, I think we've lost him. All right. I think let me just give him a quick call. Um, I think he's internet bond. Just give me one second. Hope he didn't get attacked by cyber security by cyber threats. <laughs> Okay, so I just got a message from him. He says um, uh, his PC just his PC just switched off. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, Sean, can we move to you for now? And then while he's just rebooting his laptop. Hey, Len. Uh, yeah, sure, we can do. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to say it it will probably only make sense after Lucas's presentation, but I can go ahead and say it and. I think it'll probably work uh, both ways. All right, thank you. Cool, so um, uh, you did introductions, but I'm Sean Hancock, a security and network specialist at Seto Networks. We are prior primarily an uh, MSP uh, provider, and I'm just going to explain a bit how we use SOFOS as part of our, our security suite. Um, a webinar like this can often feel like we're trying to maybe scare you about the, all the various threats and attacks. But it's really just about education so you can make informed decisions around securing your business. Um, it's definitely a, you definitely want to take a proactive approach to security because if you take a reactive approach, it means it's generally already too late. Um, Lucas is going to talk a lot about how, how the, let, uh, the, the threat landscape is forever changing. There's always new threats, and it's really uh, our jobs to to research them, combat them, learn how to how to mitigate them, and also keep you guys aware because keeping your users aware um, is is really really important. They're generally the weakest link uh, due to just simple human error and perhaps just a, a lack of knowledge on the subject. Uh, we've been using Sophos products for, I think, almost 10 years now as part of our security suite. When ransomware first became a serious threat, we were able to quickly mitigate most of the attacks using the, the XG firewall. Um, what we did is we locked down customer environments to specific geolocations uh, and made use of client-to-site VPNs. I'm sure a lot of you are using VPNs today. Um, the idea is just to, to make sure your users are securely connecting to their environments um, which allows us to close all publicly open ports. Uh, so attackers, when they try scan, they don't even see your environment. They, they, they don't even try attack it. Um, uh, so a lot of these attacks today are coming through via phishing attacks. Um, I'm sure everyone's been part of one. Uh, they're extremely uh, popular amongst attackers, uh, especially since COVID and lockdown, people working from home, uh, it's just easier to trick someone when they're by themselves. They, you know, if you're in an office environment and you get a phishing mail, everyone is like, hey, did you get this mail? Yes, I got it. It looks a bit fishy. Let's not open it. But when you're by yourself, maybe, you know, you're not you're not asking other people and it's it's much easier to get tricked. Uh, there, you could also be downloading malicious files, which would be uh, to to create ransomware on your network. And um, one of the, the products that SOFOS has is called a Fish Threat, and we're able to simulate these phishing attacks uh, on your business. Uh, with the simulation, we can then identify users of high risk. Uh, users of high risk, you can then go and give a specific training to them. Hey, you shouldn't be opening these mails, or why did you think this was safe? So it can really give you um, an idea of your business of where, where the risk is and, and who's really putting yourself, uh, your business at risk. A big um, phishing example, and, and as I said, I'm sure you've all been part of an attack. Uh, it's very common at the moment. A very common one at the moment is once attackers compromise a mailbox, 
could be one of your customers, could be one of you. They will go and email everyone in your contact list uh, a phishing attack. So it, it kind of spreads from mailbox to mailbox. And this might look like a SharePoint link saying that payment has changed or please click on this file. If you want to view it, please log in and it will take you to a very legitimate uh, login page that looks exactly like Microsoft. Um, they really put a lot of effort into making it look real. Sometimes they don't, but often they do. And uh, it, it will just trick a user into giving their details. And once they've given up their details, they use that mailbox to then push out another phishing attack to all of their contacts. And that's really how it, it spreads pretty quickly. Um, tying into that, uh, a simple but a really effective part of security is uh, at the moment is MFA, also known as multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication. I'm sure everyone has heard of it, and it's really not a new concept. Uh, banks have been doing it for decades when they first started giving dongles to customers that would provide a one-time PIN. I'm sure a lot of you remember that. Today, this has become extremely important. Uh, with MFA, if your if your user does give away their details to to a phishing a phishing attack, if MFA and multi-factor is enabled, the attacker would still need to retrieve that second factor to break in, which is extremely difficult unless they have the user's mobile device or if they telephonically call that user and trick them into giving away that that two FA code. Uh, which is possible, but again, that's where user training comes in to make sure a user would would never give up those details. Uh, a little bit off topic to to phishing, but still ties in with security and Poppy at the moment is is Drive Encryption, um, another product that we we make use of from from Sophos, and this encrypts all the contents of your machine, much like a ransomware attack would. However, in this case. Uh, you hold the keys, so you are the one encrypting and and protecting the data. Uh, most users uh, have laptops these days and often working from home, meaning that the laptop is moving around a lot more than it used to. The risk of of theft and and loss is very high, and drive encryption mitigates the risk of leaking data that would be on the laptop. With Poppy in place, uh, even leaking a small Excel document with customer information can really lead to big implications um, and fines. Uh, last thing for me um, is, I think Lucas is back on. Um, so unfortunately, Lucas is still having some issues. Um, he's, uh, yeah, his laptop is giving him some issues. Yeah. So okay, cool. I still have, I still start. Let me just chat about the one more thing and hopefully he's he's back up by then. Okay. Um, so, one of the last things I wanted to chat, chat to you guys about uh, is if you want to get a better idea of where your business stands in regards to security, we do what's called an NSA, um, a network security assessment, where we use various tools um, which covers security quite holistically across your business to identify risk. So the some of the topics that we cover in the security assessment is industry risk. Uh, we try to see where, where your risk is compared to other industry, to other companies in your industry. How do you compare to them? What are your main risks for your industry? Uh, physical security, uh, how, uh, literally how your physical security is. Where's your server room? Do you even have one anymore? Uh, you know, how are people getting into your office? When can they come in? Things like that. Your network security, uh, this can cover, you know, your, your firewall, your policies on the firewall, uh, VLANs and, and even your Wi-Fi, is it easy to crack? You know, how, how secure is it? Your identity and access, uh, quite important at the moment. That ties in with multi-factor multi -factor authentication, how people are moving around in your organization. You've got more in the cloud. Some is over here, some is over there. How is, how is it all tying together? Um, email and messaging, this just looks at how you're, you're messaging and is it encrypted? Are you, is your data secure while it's in transit? Uh, data and compliance. Also, how is how are you handling data? Are you encrypting it? Are you, when you're moving it around, is it, is it password protected? Things like that. It doesn't need to be password protected, or is it not an important file? Uh, also, look at your systems and applications. Uh, are they secure? Are they are they at any risk to to the rest of your network, or or vice versa? Uh, your backup and DR, which you might not think 
is completely a, a security uh, topic, but we we do see it as a, a security topic. The way your your disaster recovery fits into your plan, it does put your business at risk. Um, so maybe not completely security, but still very high in risk. Uh, your policies and procedures. This kind of ties into Poppy and other stuff like that. How how you have sure that you you've given training maybe to your users and you've you've done a few things to become compliant but you haven't documented any of it or you don't have policies in place to show that you've done these things which is really important if you ever get audited or just for following process in general we also touch on prevention and maintenance and that's just general upkeeping being proactive on your network are things up to date and and things like that then we would also do a internal vulnerability scan and an external vulnerability scan and last but not least we would do a phishing simulation to to really test the awareness of your users um, across the board uh cool this is pretty much where i would have handed over back to elaine but um <laughs> hopefully hopefully we've got lucas coming back soon um, so right. if you can ask how how do you see whether it is a phishing attack um on an email, is there a way that you can identify these type of emails coming through? Or is it just, you just kind of have to, if it feels wrong, it's wrong? Uh, definitely, if it feels wrong, it's it's wrong. You want to always ask your IT uh, administrators if you're not sure. It, they're becoming extremely hard to to identify because they're coming from people you know. Uh, someone who's emailed you before is being compromised and that person is now the phishing attack is now coming from them if you're not expecting a mail from them and it looks dodgy call them find out find out if they sent this to you um, if you're not sure it's best to call the person because emailing back will not help their mailbox is compromised so it, it is hard and it does take uh, as i said awareness and training um, that's the best way of of learning how to identify them cool and, and also, i see lucas is back yeah, just uh, quickly to wrap up that, and also when you phone, you don't phone the the phone number on the email. You phone, yes. you either Google the the company and find a phone number, or you phone the number you've got. Hundred percent. Use a number that you know is is theirs that you've used before. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Lucas, you back? <laughs> yes, um, I'm bragging about my cybersecurity skills. Looks like somebody is playing games with me. <laughs> yeah, we were wondering what's happening. Yes. All right, thank you, Lucas. All right, yes. Uh, moving on. Sorry about that. Um, um, uh, sorry for 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 the interruption. So uh, that's the problem with virtual meetings these days, I suppose. So where I ended up was in the uh, in the uh, um, I was just saying about the demographics about companies that were being attacked. And uh, I kind of closed off there, so I wanted to move on and um, talk about uh, the cybersecurity landscape again. And uh, uh, what we've seen is two out of three organizations actually fell victim to a cyber attack. So the ones we surveyed actually said two out of three of them said, yes, they have been attacked. And what I found interesting here is that um, if you look at the countries hit the most and the least, South Africa actually featured here. And uh, it was very interesting that 69% of companies we spoke to actually admitted to a cyber crime or cyber attack, uh, whether it was deployed in different methods or not. It is basically, uh, it did um, actually happen. And um, it's quite a high number if you think about it. If you look at there, we can see that the UK actually admitted to less attacks than us. And I, and I think it's because we're becoming easy targets and easy victims. And uh, I'll like, elaborate on that a little bit more. So two out of the attacks were really successful. Um, so we see that people said they have seen an attack, but they could manage to block it. But uh, two out of every uh, attack actually um, uh, did manage to find its way through to attack the organizations. And then nine out of 10 actually admitted and said, well, said to us that they thought they had an up-to-date cybersecurity system. If you are wearing a Garmin watch right now, you would have known that in the last year, August, all of the Garmin watches, your data was kind of missing. Um, if you had fitness data on it, all your map data and those things uh, would have been gone. And uh, that's really because Garmin actually was hit by a ransomware attack. And they, um, talk, uh, they basically spoke to Sofos as, as the vendor, and they told us that 
they actually had an up-to-date cybersecurity system. Uh, you can imagine people like Garvin, they're a big organization worldwide. Um, you can imagine they turn around and they said to us, they thought they had all the necessary cybersecurity measurements in place. And they still to date actually do not know how they were attacked or how they got ransomware in a sense. And then there are high risks of concern around um, cyber attacks. So it doesn't matter in what industry you on or in, um, the biggest risk that um, customers are complaining about is obviously data loss. So uh, most of the organizations that we spoke to said, listen, if I lose my data, I'm in big trouble. And uh, it's true for any sense of organization. If you work with clients, uh, if, I mean, if you bank with NetBank and tomorrow somebody phones you and said they got your ID number from NetBank, you won't be very happy and you'll probably move to a different bank um, just because of that. And then also damage to business is a big concern for people. So people are saying, listen, uh, if I do get ransomware um, or if I do get an attack, if people find out about it, um, people might move, my customers might move to a different organization and it can, that brand damage that it does to your organization is huge. And uh, you'll see that most organizations these days, um, globally, it's kind of a, a norm with GDPR and in Poppy with South Africa, it's coming into play, that if you do lose data, you'd have to actually admit it. You'd have to actually publicly make it available. So if you're a financial institution and you lost your um, employees or your um, customers' records, you'd have to publicly announce that and say, listen, we've lost some of your data. Um, we need to tell you about that. And that is huge brand damage to your organization. And then a cost and time and money to recover from it. We actually, I actually assisted a customer last week. Um, they a big financial um, institution in South Africa, well, relatively big, and um, they have about 300 branches and so on. They were had a, a ransomware attack and for them to recover from this threat is, is an absolute uh, enormous task. Their backups were encrypted. They could only restore data from six months ago that was stored on tape. And uh, you can imagine the effort and money they have to now spend to actually recover from this kind of threat and also the business interruptions they have with the customers they cannot serve and the customers they're losing in the meantime. And so why is uh, organizations still struggling with cyber attacks? So, uh, it's because attacks really come from multiple directions. And uh, the big thing here is literally email is still one of the biggest attack threat vectors out there. Phishing emails are still uh, the big delivery payloads for, for attacks. And uh, it really is a, a big concern around um, organizations. Phishing email is really something that uh, still people still fall for it. And it's not because uh, employees are, are really um, not that clever or uh, can't keep up with the trends. It is because the, the attack adversaries and vectors are really becoming more targeted and more clever choreographed, if you want to call it that. Things are choreographed in a way where it, uh, attackers really struggle to, to, to or, or they, they actually uh, are so clever that the, the victims really struggle to identify phishing emails these days. It, uh, they even so, um, I've helped a customer uh, yesterday and he's just a one man show. But what happened is he bought a bucky from Isuzu or something. Um, he was sent an invoice, but the email was interrupted in the meantime and he paid 160,000 Rand into somebody else's account. So how does these guys know you are buying a backy? How, how do they know uh, what, your, what your movement is? And it really is because they actually have access to this person's email. And that's what it basically narrowed down to is they guessed his password and um, they actually logged on to his email account and saw email flowing around and then they intercept that email. Then three out of 10 attacks is web attacks. Web attacks are general attacks where you go onto a website, you see some random ad, and you're interested in buying those shoes or or that camera for that matter because it looks like a good bargain you click on that web attack and it actually has a malware payload in that attack software vulnerabilities are still a big thing uh, people are not doing patches so if your windows machine comes up and says i need to reboot because i've done a, a windows upgrade or a windows patch Normally, those vulnerabilities are still being exposed because people hibernate their machines, servers need to be online all the time. So people tend to steer away from patch management. Um, they don't really patch the machines uh, um, regularly or often enough. Then USB and external drives is a very interesting topic. And in South Africa, it's really picking up. 
um, we've seen that uh, IT, IT administrators and companies are becoming more security aware. So what they do is they block things like Dropbox and uh, all these freebie sh software sharing applications. And people tend to share device drives and presentations and, and other things like movies on memory sticks. Uh, at my previous company, we did an interesting survey. We actually bought a, mem uh, a thousand memory sticks. Uh, we basically unbranded them and uh, we put a piece of software on it um, that really just calls a server to tell us if the memory stick has been plugged in. Uh, we spread about a thousand of them over South Africa, like leave them in the boardroom, uh, leave them in a parking lot or something like that. And 85% of those memory sticks were plugged in. So people are inquisitive. They wanted to see what's on the memory stick or they thought, OK, I'm scoring a memory stick, so let me use it. So for, 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 for the matter of sake, we could have put a piece of malware on that and infected the user's machine with something just because they were inquisitive by plugging in those memory sticks. And then 20% of the people we surveyed actually told us they do not know how they were attacked. And then COVID-19 is, a, I know it's a, it's a topic that everybody talks about, but it really um, is a, a driver for attacks, especially phishing emails. I've got a good example here. Um, this is Sophos Labs, research from our labs team. Our labs team consists about of 800 people that works 24-7 around the clock, around the globe. And we really see about 400,000 malware samples a day, new ones. Uh, uh, samples that really gone uh, something else that's popped up in the environment. And we see the growth in email scams on the rise uh, uh, related to, to the coronavirus or COVID. For this example, this was a good one. And I can tell you now we protect over 1 billion endpoints and we have over 500,000 customers. And a, a lot of our, about 20% of our customers were affected by this specific email that came from the World Health Organization, apparently, but it wasn't. Um, you can see the domain says at who int. Um, and what happened is this mail had an attachment in it with a piece of embedded malware in it that does credential harvesting. And literally 20% of our customers clicked on this attachment. You can see the attachment is a zip file. So it's obviously obfuscated that it is malware. But a lot of people believed, OK, they need to, to know this information um, from the World Health Organization because they need to know about this virus and so on. And uh, literally, it gave them a computer virus. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a big thing, um, uh, phishing emails in the organizations. Then you see here um, what's interesting to us in Africa and South Africa is 40% of scams came from literally or, or people that were infected were via email and uh, then software exploits and those things following close by. But what I found interesting is you could see that the rest of the world, except for Germany, you think um, they're the smartest people in the world, right? Um, they were infected uh, also by a high number of emails by people clicking on, on phishing emails. And then ransomware, it's still around. It's really uh, a, a clever mechanism that's running around. And it's really a, a pioneered new way of avoiding endpoint security. So if you have some kind of a traditional AV tools on your machine, they really know how to bypass these tools and work around it. Um, they also know how to bypass your backups and uh, they really share across families, if you can call it that. So the ransomware guys are are guys that in good state, they talk to one another, unlike security vendors, they're actually friends and they, they help one another to work collaboratively to actually find new exploits in Windows or Linux um, to actually find new threats. Um, just and then the, the, the ransomware cases, a lot of people think ransomware is just around uh, theft and security and extortion of the market, but it, it, it isn't just encrypting your data. They also will leak your data if you're not willing to pay them. So what we found, um, we actually last week worked with a customer um, that was ransomware, and um, we actually saw that this customer said to us, um, the ransomware guys told them to pay the ransom. They refused because they could recover from a backup. And then I said, okay, cool, you guys are refusing, but we will actually go to your poppy regulator and give them the data that we've extorted from your organization. So pay us this, and we will not give the data to the poppy regulator. Very interesting case um, and uh, an organization that's sitting in a tight spot. Um, but yes, yeah, so that is the, the other um, method they're using now. If you're not willing to pay the ransom, they threaten you by blackmailing you that they will give the data to the regulators or tell the rest of the world that they have your data.
So then common methods of ransomware that's running, um, you can see here there's exfiltration tool sets that sits on GitHub. It's a little bit technical this, but here is where some of the tools are floating around that we see that's being used to, to actually work with ransomware or exploit or actually install ransomware on machines. And you can see here there's common tools like 7-Zip, WinRAR, um, uh, PSFTP is actually used to extort the data from your organization to their, to their methods or to their servers to actually um, put that blackmailing um, thing down, like I said. And uh, these are, are nice tools that you can actually go and download. If I pull it that way, I say nice tools, but not so nice for organizations. These tools are freely available. It's not tools that you need to go and find from the dark web or whatever. If you if you look at Revol and those type of tools, you can download this tool from Gmail or Google. You can Google it and download it because in a sense, the tool itself is not malicious, but used in the right way the tool is actually used to actually um, deploy ransomware. Then uh, ransom cloud storages, where they actually exfiltrate your data from. They steal data from Google Drive, Amazon's S3, and then private FTP servers is normally where they actually install their software, where they can actually dissect your data and steal your data if um, you're not willing to actually pay the ransom by exposing you in that way. Then cyber attacks are multi-stage and coordinated. So like I said, phishing emails, you can see here, that's still the best way of stealing data because it's difficult to hack a firewall. It's firewalls these days are strong devices. It doesn't matter where, what vendor you're from, but it, it's not that easy to actually go in the back end and find a vulnerability in the firewall and actually see, okay, this is the way to steal data or even Windows or a server for that matter. It's a lot easier to actually form the user into clicking on an email and uh, do a social engineering attack than it is to actually hack a server or hack a firewall for that matter. And then you can see your phishing emails, 47% South Africa, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. And then the big thing, the, one of the third concerns that we see that organizations are telling us, talent technology is in a short, short supply. So what we see is 86% of organizations said, yes, they need more cybersecurity skills. And I think anybody on this call will probably agree with me that cybersecurity skills is in a shortage and it's difficult to find somebody to give you the right advice. There's a lot of vendors like ourselves, like Sophos out there, uh, a, a lot of other, uh, other vendors, and everybody just wants to sell you a product and Dropbox something and say, this is going to protect your organization. But in reality, um, the skill shortage is so high that we're struggling to find people to give us the right advice to see how we can secure our organizations. And then, um, like I said, eight out of 10 struggle to recruit the right skills. Some people, 74% here in South Africa, uh, actually said, we've employed somebody but it isn't actually the skill we needed. There's too, too, too many gaps in, in, in this market. And then budget. Budget is a big thing for organizations. People do not want to spend money on, on, on cybersecurity. They, they only uh, saw a thing on LinkedIn actually where there's a little flask or a piggy bank and it's empty um, and then that's the cybersecurity budget. And then after attack, the, the piggy bank all of a sudden is full. So it really is a, it's, it's a thing of concern in South Africa. We, our, and in the rest of the world, as you can see, most people will say, I don't want to actually spend money right now on this, on this um, um, solution because I don't need it. I haven't been infected. Um, what we see with Sophos, a lot of our business is grudge purchases. And it sounds terrible, but it is what it is. Uh, customers are buying only once they got infected or once they were hit with a ransomware attack. It's, it's then they go back and say, listen, can we can we look at, a, at, at something or to protect our business because we had to pay a 500,000 rand ransom or something like that. So how do we solve all these things? And really, it's the idea is to have more extensive technology that's more innovative. Time and skills and budget is obviously an issue. We need to address those things. And then um, time for a different approach is the idea. So what we can say today is most security solutions are point security solutions. What I'm saying with that is if you buy a firewall, you're gonna buy a firewall maybe from 14 a checkpoint, Palo Alto or so forth. And then when you're looking at cybersecurity, it's a holistic approach. You can't just say, okay, I just have a firewall. You have remote workers now. Now the vendors are coming to you and say, you've got remote workers, you need to secure them. Then 
people pop up like Kaspersky, Trend, Semantic, uh, many other products is out there. And they say, let's buy this product and we protect our endpoint. But those products really work in isolation. They don't actually talk to one another. They don't share any information. And most of the organizations that buy from us as SOFOS, they have one IT manager and he's the security guy, he's everything. And that guy then needs to manage a Kaspersky dashboard, a SOFOS dashboard, a Fortinet dashboard, and many other products together. And to find frets in those dashboards is becoming a nightmare because we cannot um, collate um, policies. We can't uh, put in together the same um, technology. And it really becomes a, a nightmare to manage these products. It's OK for an enterprise company, say like a, a big bank, to say, OK, listen, we're going to buy best of Gardner breed products because they have a security as a team, a SOC as a, t as a service, or maybe a big security organization where they have guys that just looks at the endpoint technology and guys that just look at firewall but most of our customers do not have that luxury you need cybersecurity as an ecosystem where things are working together and can share information and it's centrally managed from one dashboard so just a little bit of a, of a sales speed for Sophos. So I'll steer away from this quickly. But what we have here is we have a cybersecurity as an ecosystem where we have a central dashboard where you can run your security operations, threat hunting, and so on within this dashboard. And we have multiple products that bolt into this dashboard. So if you're looking at an XDR, extended restriction response product, you could be buying it from Sophos and just bolting it on. With Poppy, we see a lot of people are interested in encryption because if your laptop gets stolen from your car or the airport, your that laptop is really exposed if it's not encrypted. You might have a strong Windows password, but it's very easy for a person like myself to take your laptop and actually get your data from your My Documents without knowing your Windows password, even by just taking the drive out of the machine physically. If the device is actually encrypted, it would be impossible for me to dissect that data. So a lot of people want encryption enabled these days. So, so some of our customers is running our endpoint technology as an antivirus. They protect their organization by saying, let's enable encryption because we need it because Poppy is knocking on our door and we're not complying to certain aspects. We have an email security product that actually can uh, look at phishing emails and, and impersonation emails um, to protect you against those kind of threats. And then we also have firewalls that fits into a space. And all of these products really work together, what we call synchronized security. If an endpoint is infected with a malware, a piece of malware, the firewall will actually lock that machine out from getting access to the internet until it's cleaned up. So um, last on the, on the subject line here is just some IT security hygiene and tips. Um, I like to give some tips away at the end of the the presentation and it really just doesn't matter if you're using SOFOS or if you're interested in, in our product or if you're interested in getting an endpoint protection or a next generation firewall or encryption for that matter or an XDR tool for that matter. So uh, what I've seen in the industry and in South Africa, I would say geolocation blocking on Office 365 logins. What I mean by that in Office 365, if you're using it, which a lot of people are using at the moment, you'll see that people's passwords are easy to guess these days. They run a brute force password attack, for example, against one of your employees, say one of the finance ladies, and her password might be very simple. A lot of organizations, for example, what they do is if the, bank, if the, the organization name is ABC uh, Lockers, a lot of the passwords are ABC Lockers at 2020. And it's something easy to guess. So they run brute force attacks against normal average users because they know they don't have strong passwords. And then they laterally move by just guessing that user's password or obtaining that user's password. And then they literally log in to their Office 365 account saying, even if they're sitting in China or Russia or whatever the case may be, or Korea, and they will log in from there and just observe your email that you're sending. And that way they learn who you are, who your CFO are, who your CEO are, and then they laterally start moving within the organization and target those high profile individuals to get account details. So Office 365 actually have the ability to say, do not allow anybody to log into the email accounts without the borders of South Africa. So you can say, I just want South African people to be able to log into my email accounts. So that's, that's a simple security measure you can do without buying any products. Disable remote desktop services um, from externally. A lot of people are moving to cloud spaces like Azure and AWS. 
and they cannot access these servers. So what do they do is they open remote desktop and remote desktop is the easiest way to obtain passwords and actually log on to machines. They brute force attack your admin password or they get a, a user to, to do credential harvesting or click on an email and actually then harvest those credentials. And if remote desktop is open publicly, it's so easy for these adversaries to actually log on to those machine and, and, and then um, obviously uh, uh, do malicious activities on this machine. Use a sense of VPN or zero trust networks actually to actually to secure those environments. If you're looking into moving to Azure or AWS, I had a small insurance company that spoke to me two weeks ago and they said, no, they were tired of on-prem data center. They don't want a, a, a data center anymore because they have to pay for electricity and they need to put an aircon in the device. They need to actually um, uh, put a fire suppression unit, try and make sure the device has a generator. So they moved their workloads to Azure. But their perception was that if you move to Azure, everything is well and it's secure. So they had a firewall on premise, but in Azure they thought, okay, they don't need a firewall. They were have since attacked. They suffered a, a big malware attack with, that went through phishing emails. They stole some of their data. They weren't ransomware. And they said to me, how? Azure says it's a secure platform. And that is so untrue. Azure does not say anything is secure. They say your physical server is secure, but they not care. They don't care for your workloads or your processes that run. So if you're planning to move to Azure or to AWS, there's a lot of South African companies that has uh, the ability to move you to these spaces, but speak to a security advisor, a trusted advisor, a company that can help you to secure these workloads. Don't just think of your budget and say, okay, I'm going to move this stuff here and all is well. It's not all well. Most of our ransomware attacks in South Africa, about 80% comes from Azure or AWS workloads that's unsecure. Look into email protection that has a VIP protection built in. What I mean by that, most of the phishing emails are impersonation emails. They pretend to be the CEO. So if the guy's name is Colin, they might change uh, the one L to an I, and it will really look like Colin has sent you an email. But Colin's actually is spelled C O I I N um, with maybe a capital I, so that you can't see that it's an L. And that's what really is obfuscating some of these emails that are coming. So if you have an email protection product, Sophos has a product called Essential Email Advance, and we have VIP protection built in, where you can specify CFOs and CEOs, or eye rollers in the companies that can authorize payments, and we will look at those and say, Colin has actually has been spoofed because it's an I, it's not an L. So, and it will alert that email and block it, or alert the sender that the email is not coming from the original column. Invest in a good endpoint product. So traditional AV is not good enough these days. Um, if you look at so far, we're not bulletproof. I'm not saying we're the silver bullet. If you install our endpoint pr product, yes, we've been Gardner, uh, a Gardner leader for 13 years in a row. But our endpoint product still, they, you, you still have a 5% chance of getting infected. Um, if you have a good product, you can do things like application control. So when users are taking their PCs home, you should be not allowing them to use BitTorrent or VPN programs to bypass certain security measures you have in place. BitTorrent is something you can download movies with. We all know that. Um, everybody in the call probably has used it once or twice. But if you're using it on your work machine, you're posing a big risk to your organization if you download a bit or a movie that's infected with malware and you VPN back to your organization and spread that threat around your organization. So good endpoint protection is a good start. A good next generation firewall with advanced threat protection building. Advanced threat protection blocks ransomware from command and control sites. Ransomware sites are domains that's registered that lives on the internet. And those are malicious sites and can be tracked by a vendor like Sophos or any other vendor for that matter. Run automated tasks to check for, for, for tasks that's being switched off or processes that's being switched off. So what I've seen with all of the ransomware cases I've worked on, the adversaries switch, switched Windows shadow copies off on machines. If you're not technical, Windows shadow copies is a way to actually recover from a, a, a Windows uh, 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 breakdown, say your machine is broken or uh, and the machine actually can't recover, you can actually use a shadow copy that's like a backup that's built into Windows. And if you have this on, you can actually then recover from ransomware. So what the ransomware guys did with one of my organizations that I work with, with one of my clients, they switched 200 servers, Windows shadow copies off at the same time. That's a high alert to your organization because switching Windows shadow copies off 
um, is a pure sign of ransomware going to be deployed as the next step. Have application control on your endpoints like Block PowerShell and 7-Zip and PSFTP with application control. If you have a good endpoint product, you can do this off the bat by a click of a button. Very few users use PowerShell on their machine. However, PowerShell is a powerful script scripting tool in Windows 10 and Windows Server to be used by adversaries to actually obfuscate or run any threats within an organization. You as a user probably has never used PowerShell on your machine. So if it's not used, block it so that you, the adversaries cannot use this tool against your organization. Um, that is it for day, today. It's not too long, I hope. Um, you can uh, ask uh, any questions now if you want, I think. Um, I don't know if it's only be posted, but yes, you can ask questions or whatever. We can take it from there. Yes, sorry, I tried to share my screen there. Uh, let me put my video back on so we can see faces. Right, so Lucas, just from my side, quickly before we go into some of the questions, um, you were talking about people not being so technical. I would be one of those. So, uh, with patch, patch management, does that mean you have to switch off your laptop every day yeah. after work so that it reboots every day um because i know i'm guilty of sometimes just putting my laptop to sleep and i don't always switch it off and switch it back on is that how that works or how does the patch management exactly work so, so windows uh, generally does its own updates and at the bottom you'll have a little update reminder telling you have to reboot your machine because this update has to be done so that is when you should be rebooting or your machine at least or not necessarily switching it off but rebooting it when windows asks you to reboot it has a little reminder in the pop-up at the bottom and it will say to you i've done updates i want to reboot and that's when you should execute that reboot because those updates could be security patches, could be security management uh, updates. So that's when it's important. The rest of the time you can hibernate it or put it to sleep. But once that update comes in, that's when, when Microsoft patches things that there's a vulnerability. They don't necessarily say that, but when you click into the details, you'll see why it's being patched. There is a reason behind it. So it's a good uh, practice to actually reboot it when it asks you. You could let it float for a day or two, but it's, it's obviously the sooner you can reboot it once that happens the better if you have a next generation firewall that sits within your organization and it's a desktop pc that sits at the work all the time most next generation firewalls gets what we call uh, intrusion prevention signatures and those updates include those threats so even if a, a attack victim knows that your machine is not patched the firewall will block that threat which is quite a nice uh, feature of firewalls but most users are sitting at home these days so it's a different game then Wow. Yeah, that uh, floating there for a day or two, I get that because Windows always have this way of when you're halfway in a meeting, it starts popping up. It needs yes, to be. That's <laughs> exactly that. That's what I mean. um, then I just wanted to, you were talking about Colin with an I or an E and a, how, how easy it is for, for some of these um, phishing attacks. And uh, there, there's somebody that I know that um, is a CEO at a company and he the finance team received an email from him saying that they needed to pay some money into this certain account his signature everything luckily the finance team knew the ceo well enough to know that how he closed his email wasn't the way he normally did okay and that's the way they spotted it but that is i mean that was literally a word but the rest of the email looked perfect so it's scary how how they can hide things and how observant you need to be. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate because the, the thing with that technology also is a lot of people say, but I have antivirus, I have a firewall. The guy example that I used with the Isuzu Bucky as well, he said to me, but I've got antivirus, I paid 12,000 Rand for it. But <laughs> antivirus do not pick up threats within an email that's been um, maliciously uh, created together because it looks like a legit email. I mean, antivirus cannot tell you that a, a user has put an I and an L on the on the on, on his email account. Only email protection products can help you in that sense. 
I see there's another question. Somebody said, um, do you get malware as soon as you click on the links and if you if you give or do you have to give them information? So Christian, yeah, a very interesting question. It, it is, um, you'll see mail sometimes is obfuscated and uh, I once uh, did a demo at a customer or a partner and they actually, and the one woman clicked on the email immediately and I said, why? And she says, I want to know things. I'm inquisitive. I want to, I want, I'm interested. I want to know. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's an interesting uh, theory. But what happens is the answer is yes and no. It's twofold. So what happens is if you click on an email and there's an Adobe attachment attached to it, if it's normally a zip file, I would steer away from it completely because zip files could be anything. You don't know what's in there. Um, if it's a PDF, it will normally ask you for more information. It will have a link embedded in the PDF and then it will take you to a link. But as soon as you click that link, that's when you become a victim. Um, also with Excel, it's normally macros. As soon as you say enable macros, it will open and then it won't give you anything. And then it says to view this contact, click enable macros. When you click enable macros, that's when you allow the malware payload to be installed on your machine. So it's not necessary you go to a website and you put in your username and password by accident because it's a defaced website. You can actually have malware installed on your machines without. And we saw phishing email for a big auditing firm now that we actually, their customer or so forth. And it was very interesting. The guy actually clicked on a similar email. He also just clicked um, the URL in the PDF, one of the auditors, they didn't know. And they installed a Bitcoin miner on 1300 laptops that way. So what is happening is they're not stealing any information from the customer. They're not actually obfuscating or taking anything from them. What they're doing is they're using the processing power of their machines to mine Bitcoins for a specific account. So all the machines started getting slow and everything and they locked calls and whatever. And then we realized there's a Bitcoin miner installed on their machine. So that's another way of, of malware, if you want to call it that. They, they're they just using your machine to mine Bitcoins for them because Bitcoins is worth 800,000 Rand at the moment. Um, so And it's, it goes about processing power. So that's not necessarily malware, but it's stealing their processing power, their electricity to mine Bitcoins for them. So there's different ways of email. So very good question. Thanks, Christian. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, something that I also took from this and and uh, Sean, thank you for your presentation earlier, or your discussion that you had, is exactly what Lucas was also saying is rather rather budget upfront to get the things in place, then to be a victim and then have to spend five hundred thousand odd rand to fix the problem, and then still having to purchase the, the cyber security. I had a customer at, uh, three uh, about uh, two months ago and they asked for 600,000 Rand ransom and they were really desperate because the information they had was super important to them. They paid the ransom in Inferium um, online currency and the guys just disappeared. They didn't give them the data back. But 85% um, oh so, but, but of people that pay the ransom do get their data back. So because if there's no business, there won't be a business for ransomware, right? But yes, these guys obviously took their money and ran and uh, they didn't actually give the data back to the customer. So they lost 600,000 just in that. And now they have to purchase so fast and invest in firewalls, invest in a better backup strategy. So they threw 600,000 Rand in the water and adding more to the product to actually not get um, ransomware again. Because what is very interesting about ransomware as well, the customers I work with, they get ransomware today, they recover from it with backups and so on. And two weeks later, they ransomware them again. Um, so they float around because they didn't protect one laptop. So if you get ransomware, it's very important that you cover your entire estate. You can't just leave one machine alone because a lot of people say, no, only my servers got ransomware. Let me use the desktops. They install so, uh, uh, software on the desktops as well, and they call it palomorphic malware. And that malware actually just sits in a dead state. It does nothing. So no antivirus or anything picks it up. And then after two weeks, they spin that up again and start uh, running a new ransomware case. So it is, uh, it's the wild, wild west out there for us. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the end point also is very important when you look at people working remotely. I think the more and more people work remotely, you think your laptop is serving two two sides, business and some personal yeah. at night when I want to watch a video or uh, look at Facebook or whatever it is. And um, yeah, if you're not protected, 
I think that's, that's a big problem. When you become a victim, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? Let's have a look quickly at the chat box. I don't think so. I didn't see anything. Anything. Okay. So what we're going to do is please feel free after the presentations are completed and the webinar is finished, we will share the webinar with you if you would like to, to have it. So we'll send an email. If you would like to have it, we'll send it through to you. Um, and if there's any questions, please feel free to contact us. You can contact myself directly on the email that I'll send through and we'll give you through to the right people. We'll get Sean involved and his team involved and uh, let's let's keep our people safe. And uh, Elaine, um, I see Christian because he asked the question. Um, can he mail you? I've got a little gift for him just because he asked oh, the question. Of course, I've got his details. So for socks. <laughs> <laughs> I've got his details. I'll definitely send it. I'll get every, all the details from him and send it through to you. Yeah, and then I'll just pass him on a, a pair of sofa socks. Okay. <laughs> Good stuff. Right. Thank you, every, everyone, for joining. I hope you found it valuable. And uh, we will send all the information through. Excellent. Have a Thanks, fantastic Mark. weekend. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Bye bye. Cheers.